This is the best way to play Echo in Overwatch 2. Echo is one of the most versatile heroes in the game in terms of playstyle, because she's one of the few heroes in the game who have both range and mobility. Your five main playstyles are to duel, flank, dive, poke or peel, some of which can overlap. When dueling and flanking, you'll look to utilise your burst damage and mobility to get on top of immobile, squishy heroes. When diving, you'll also be doing that, but more synchronised with your team. You poke when you can outrange the enemy team, and you can also peel against something like a ball slam with your stickies and beam. Echo's weapon, Genji Shoken's Barbetta, makes Echo fire 3 bursts of energy in a triangular pattern, with each shot dealing 17 damage with 12 ammo in one clip. Conceptually, this is the most simple part of Echo's kit, and because there's no fall off, your try shot allows you to lead into the poking playstyle, which I'll explain more in the playstyle section. The only thing worth noting is to be comfortable landing shots against aerial squishies or just squishy targets in general in order to then lead into the dueling playstyle. You should have no problem landing shots against someone like a Farah, and note that Echo is probably the best projectile counter for Farah. Before I continue, if you want to get personalised one-on-one -on -one coaching, check the link in my Discord down below. Echo's first ability, the Explodies, makes Echo fire a volley of 6 sticky bombs, dealing up to 180 damage in total with a 1 second cast time. They're also on a 6 second cooldown. Likewise to your try shot, this will mainly be used for spam before the team fight actually occurs in order to gain early ult charge. Toss these down chokes towards grouped up targets and congested areas to farm some easy ult charge. Bit obvious, but do make sure to guide your stickies, especially from range. Now in the actual fights, stickies can and should be used in response to your or the enemy team's aggression. For instance, using stickies once your ball slams, monkey jumps, doom seismics are all great times to use stickies for that extra burst of damage that can help confirm a kill. You can and also should come from unorthodox angles to time your aggressive pressure with your stickies. In other words, you can do a funny aerial assassination and blow up a target from seemingly nowhere. Flatter uses flight to position himself high above the bridge, breaking LOS with the enemy Ash to avoid her knowing of his position. He scouts Glissa's position and sees London trying to engage, dropping as close as possible to make his stickies easier to connect, following up with a deadly focusing beam. The three things Fletter did effectively were identifying and scouting his threat, breaking LOS with his target, and executing the combo. Echo's second ability, a tank's worst nightmare, makes Echo channel a 16 meter beam that deals 50 DPS to enemies above half HP and close to 200 DPS to those below half HP. The beam has a 2 second duration, a cooldown of 8 seconds, and can be cancelled. Your beam is just really rudimentary in terms of usage, in that if you see a target who's half HP or lower, that's just when you use it. But there's some little optimizations that you can do. For instance, when a target is roughly 60 or 70% of their HP, you can try shots, then immediately focus beam. By the time the shots land, the 50% threshold should already be reached, but of course, this relies on you hitting your shots. It's also cancelling the beam. Cancel it after you confirm a kill, or if you just mess up your thresholds. Nothing much more to it. Echo's third ability, Microsoft Flight Simulator, makes Echo fly in the air at 8 meters per second with a 3 second duration paired with a 6 second cooldown. She can also glide afterwards or from high ground at a downward speed of 4 meters per second with an increased horizontal speed of 50%. Obviously, you want to use flight to gain another angle, but maintaining and deepening that angle afterwards is an often overlooked aspect. By using flight where there is no available high ground to return to will only make you slowly fall to the low ground with fewer options and angles to take. However, by ending flight on high ground, you can end up flying even higher with no more options to play passive or aggressive. In short, treat high ground like your helipads. Here and here are places that you can end, where you have escape paths, you have cover that you can duck behind and use, etc. The next boosters you use, you get to start from higher, so you get to stay in the air for longer and you just sort of hold space and make sure you drift down over here when those run out, etc. So that's why I wanted you to, when I was saying earlier, use boosters and go left, I wanted you to go there and not here. Because here, you just kind of end up down here, or you end up down here, and then your next boosters, that's not any better. Whereas here, your second cycle of boosters would have been better effectively. You'd have been able to maintain a steeper angle on them, which is great because they're not looking that high up, which puts you on their screen, great, but that means they're hard not looking at your uh, McCree who's right here and shooting at them, etc., because their screen is in this direction. Likewise to stickies, you also don't want to waste flight before the fight begins, as not only will you not be able to follow up afterwards, but you'll also be left quite vulnerable. 
Flight should kind of be viewed as your get out of jail free card, similar to Sojourn's power slides, where you take an aggressive angle and can shift out at any moment to safety. Uh, sometimes I look at Echo a lot like this current Sojourn playstyle, where you want to play in a way to where you're going to get your shift forced, but not in a way to where you're going to have to shift in. The diva has a really the diva has to shift you out, and but then you just go out to begin with. You always have an escape route, but you're playing so aggressively that you force them to have to shift in to clear you out. So I'd rather you sh do this and then have to shift out than for you to shift in and then you're, you get caught dead. You kind of see what I'm saying? Now onto winning Echo one v ones, thanks to your flight usage, as Nata details here. The distance between both these echoes is very minimal. Let's say if Pink Echo decides to shift up in the air and go go up high, right? This echo shifts first right then this echo will go down first that's just how it works this blue echo now can shift up and will hit this top maybe when the enemy echo is maybe like over here this gives this echo a massive advantage where this echo can sort of like tower above and sort of just basically hit really easy shots if imagine if you were the echo this echo here and for some reason you know you just shift it to poke 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 right you start going down and the enemy echo shifts on top of you you're forced to look like this this is not a great look for you you have to you have to shoot the echo plus it lands stickies plus also try and beam while you're going down that's really awkward and lastly before i move on to your ultimates i'll quickly cover cancelling your flights after you reach the desired height, you can cancel your flight to gain it faster off cooldown. Since your aggression is tied to when your flight's available, any time that you can get back to maintain your uptime, take it. Echo's ultimate, Lazy Game Design V2, makes Echo duplicate any hero in the game, barring herself, gaining full use of their abilities for 15 seconds with an increased ultimate charge rate of 6.5 times. If you duplicate a tank, your HP is capped at 300. There's 5 key uses which I'll get onto now. Note that some of these uses can also overlap. The first is maintaining or threatening off angle pressure. This is when you duplicate heroes who can threaten angles and or can hold areas of the map for persistent amounts of time. Think of heroes like Sigma, Romatra or Zarya, all of which have no mobility, but when placed on a dangerous piece of high ground, they can become quite threatening. On King's or Second for example, either on defense or attack, duplicating one of these tanks and pressuring from high ground can be really tough to deal with if you're the enemy team. But also note that most DPS heroes can also threaten some off-angle pressure here too. A Soldier, Sojourn or Ash can easily farm their ultimates from this high ground and pound the enemy team. The second usage, which is kind of outdated, is for barreling aggression. Essentially, this is when you duplicate heroes who have either got high mobility or high damage, or ideally both. Think Doomfist, Reinhardt or Tracer. This is a little outdated now because of the HP cap. Gone are the days where you can just press W on Reinhardt and farm Shatter in 2 seconds, but with some more support, or by choosing some of the more mobile options, this can still definitely work. The third usage is ultimate power. In other words, duplicating a hero because of their ultimates. Flux, Grav, Bob, even pulling off Banana Blade if you have an honor, are all relatively reliable ways in winning a teamfight. The fourth usage is cooldown power. Same as the prior use, but for cooldowns. I'm not gonna lie, Ana is probably the only hero you'll be duplicating for this reason alone. Flying to high ground, duplicating Ana, and landing a big nade whilst farming Nana Boost is often a recipe for one team fights. Imagine you're on King's own first point defense, where you duplicate the Ana from high ground and nade the entire team. All I'm gonna say is, they better have a Kiriko. The fifth and last usage is for second life duplications. Using duplicate for a second life allows you to land more aggressive engages onto the enemy team. You can go further and deeper and don't have to worry about saving your flight to escape. Also, if you're losing a duel, duplicating can flip that around. Now onto Echo's positioning and playstyle. Again, starting off with the four rules of positioning always hammered on in my guides. Here's an example on which point Gibraltar. The first rule is to have cover or a corner. Really important in order to stop taking damage at any moment. I'm wondering even here, could you even take like this position up on pillars here, like shift up here? You avoid, avoid their spam angles with this high ground cover, but you have your own spam angle on their, on their downside. Uh, and then if you need to drop, you do land on something that's not like the floor. Where you're positioned right now is like the worst of both worlds because can soldiers in on a, a get an angle on you from here? Do you see their sight lines? Yeah, they will. But not only that, but can you see Doomfist Tracer to spam them? If you go to this pillar here, you have cover, and that allows you to close the distance on these guys without taking damage. The second rule is to have line of sight so you can see and shoot the enemy team. Third rule is distance from angles in order to spam out flankers before they get on top of you. And the last rule is rotations, allowing you to take different angles as the fight progresses. 
There's also some specific positioning when running Mercy and another immobile support like Arno or Zen where you want to position to where your Mercy can also help that other support. The Echo's over here, right? Then the Mercy should be flying in a position where the Mercy can help the Echo but also peel the Zen. But if he knows what happens, A Fox backs up here. Seiko's over there and now they're like so far away where the Mercy can't peel the Zen. So Seiko's positioning needs to also be relative to like the people who are non-mobile so the Mercy can peel. Now onto the plethora of playstyles that you can adopt an Echo, which do depend on the type of composition you play against. I'll let Nata give his brief overview, then I'll move to my own example. Enemy team is blue, and they're over here, and they're pushing like that. Green Echo, who's sort of like mirroring you. You see the Echo sh like go up, shift in the air, you can shift and match the Echo, take the one-on-one. -on -one. You can play with your team, and you can back up a little bit more and play with your team and sort of poke, play the high ground. You can, if you notice the enemy team going this way, like hard this way, then you can maybe like sh like push over here and look to like go for a soft flank. Or maybe you see a ball going in your back line, right? So maybe you shift back and you use sticky and beam the ball and kill the ball. So there's five main options you have on Echo. And the key thing to understand is that you're dynamically changing playstyle as the team fight progresses. And some of the play styles can overlap. Let's start with flanking. Here, the most obvious flank is deeper into the cave to your left side. And this leads me onto the dueling and diving playstyle. You could fly and duel any squishy you want from here, blowing them up with your stickies and beam, or if you're running dive, you and your dive crew just dive at targets. Simple. There is one small thing with diving, and that's to make sure that, before you dive, you clear out your angles so you don't get countered over, as Spyro gives an example of here. You have not made the ball go away, you've not burned the Echo's cooldowns, you've not forced a tracer out, you have done nothing, you've cheated, and gone straight for backline, which means now you're going to be hard focused. Like, this is map control. The Echo has a good angle, the ball has a good angle, they got that angle because they used Trance and Mines, which forced your Zen and Sigma to back off. If your Zen and Sigma didn't back off, then and this Echo could not do what she's about to do to you because she would be killed. You cannot go in aggressive while your backline is playing passive because their angle got cleared. So what's the simple answer? Because I know a lot, I've said a lot of big words. I do not want you going in aggressively backline. You can shoot backline, you can stick backline, but you do not go aggressively backline until your team has retaken the space. Now onto poking. Poking is either done at the start of fights or done more consistently against comps that haven't got much range. In this example here, because you're playing against the Mercy, Zen, Ash, who do have more poke than you, you're going to lean more into the flanking, dueling and diving playstyle. But if you're playing against a more broadly comp, you'll lean more into the poking playstyle. You can even combine poking and flanking by flanking through the cave and then poking afterwards. However, that isn't to say that you can't or shouldn't dive someone like the Baptiste when they eventually rush in, as Spalu explains here. But the big thing is that Fleta wasn't actually able to punish the backline. So again, if we go back to when Soul is rushing here, here's the rush. Where is Fleta? Fleta is in Narnia, dude. Fleta is doing absolutely nothing right now. In fact, Fleta doesn't even have shift yet. So he literally is AFK. He doesn't even land a shot until two of his teammates are dead. So Fleta needed to either be packed better, something needed to happen, he cannot get bullied out as easily as he did. Remember that you're a poke-dive hybrid. You have both range and immobility to both poke and dive. Now lastly, onto peeling. This is pretty niche, but if there's a dive tank on the enemy team, you do have the tools to blow them up with your sticky zen your beam. You will need a little bit of help, like having an Ana, Zen, or Cassidy can help make this playstyle more viable, but it is something to mention. So that was all a bit complex, but hopefully I've shown the multitude of different playstyles that you can take with Echo. You can flank and assassinate someone, duel someone up front whilst your tanks pay attention, dive a target if you're running a dive comp, poke from afar if you outrange the enemy team before you decide to get up close, or peel if you and your team are dedicated to blowing up the enemy tank when they engage. That's it for the guide. If you enjoyed, don't forget to like, comment and subscribe. And if this video helped to raise your IQ, be sure to share it with your friends to also raise theirs. Until next time.